morning. Welcome to Potomac Hills. Please stand and join us for worship. Please have a seat this morning. Good morning. morning. That was pretty good this morning. All right. My name is Josh. I'm one of your deacons here uh, at Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church. I wanted to just thank you all for being here today. And if you're joining us online, good to see you too. Um, It's Mother's Day. Thank you, mothers, for everything you do. We're so thankful for you. Um, Yes, hopefully the dads all got the memo. We're supposed to do things for you today. Um, I totally have things planned. All right, a few announcements this morning. First off, if I could get a few volunteers to help me hand out the uh, baby bottle stuff. We we do this every year. It's supporting the Mosaic Crisis Pregnancy Center things. We hand them out on Mother's Day. We have them all back by Father's Day. Um, So you you know the deal. Fill the bottle with loose change or cash or checks or whatever you want to do, right? Bring them back to church or drop it off at the church office, um, and then we'll make the donation um, after Father's Day. So, all right. Well, that's being handed out. A few other announcements that we have. Uh, We do need two guys to help teach the youngest uh, children's Sunday school classes during the course of the summer, 13 weeks. If you're interested, talk to Courtney Stein. If you're not interested, please talk to Courtney Stein. We need two more people. So, oh, it's just one now? Great. We need one more person. So be that guy and sign up. Um, The last thing that I have um, is if you have a chance this weekend around one o'clock, if you could just be thinking about the Deacons volleyball team, we are uh, meeting it for the officers retreat this coming weekend. The Deacons are going to try to defend their one year streak of beating the elders. We are not going to win because they have run Clifton this year, and we will not have Jonathan Nelson. So we're going to lose. We just don't want anyone to get hurt. So if you could be thinking about us, that would be great. We could use it. Don't shake your head at me, John. It happens every year. All right. Um, Our uh, call to worship this morning comes to us from Psalm 43. Uh, So I'll do the leader part, and you all respond with the people part. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. 
for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to come here today, and we thank you for your preservation and your care. We thank you for guiding us through this week, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to draw us closer to you, that we would learn to love you and that we would learn to serve you, that we would love doing so, serving those around us. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to make us hungry for your word. Bless those who are, have taken the preparations to prepare our hearts for worship this morning and who are delivering your word to us today. We pray, Lord, that you continue to be our strength and our protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to join us in worship? That I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died He for me who caused His pain. For me who Him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and led for Adam's helpless race. His mercy all immense and free For oh my God it found out me Amazing love how can it be That thou my God should die for me Amazing love how can it be That thou my God should die for me In prison spirit lay Fast bound in sin and nature's night Thine eye diffused the quickening ray I woke the dungeon flame with light My chains fell off, my heart was free I rose, went forth and followed thee Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Behold, I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, should die for me. Now unto the King who reigns over all and never changes or turns. Unfailing justice, unfading grace, 
whose promises remain. Yes, your promises remain. The heavens ring and the saints all sing. Great is your faithfulness. From age to age we will proclaim. Great is your faithfulness. How great is your faithfulness. Everything changes, but you stay the same. Your word and kingdom endure. We lean on the promise of all that you are and trust forevermore. We will trust forevermore. The heavens ring and the saints all sing. Great is your faithfulness. From age to age we will proclaim. Great is your faithfulness. How great is your faithfulness. From generation to generation, you never fail us, O oh God. Yes, today and today and tomorrow, until the day you return. The heavens ring and the saints all sing, great is your faithfulness. From age to age we will proclaim, great is your faithfulness. How great is your faithfulness. I come, God, I come, I return to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You strike down to bind me up, you say you do it all in love, that, that I might know you in your suffering. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. My heart and flesh may fail, the earth below give away. But with my eyes, with my eyes, I'll see the Lord. Behold, the Lamb that was slain, Lamb that was slain. And I'll know every tear was worth it all. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Though tonight I'm crying out, 
Let this cup pass from me now. You're still more than I need. You're enough for me. You're enough for me. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship, sing a song to the one who's all I need. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Please be seated. So we're going to be uh, doing the responsive prayer time that we've been doing for a while now. Um, the theme of today's responsive prayers and stuff happens to be Mother's Day, conveniently enough. So uh, we're going to be doing, uh, let's see. Uh, so you guys are going to be doing the parts in the bold. I'll be doing the parts in the unbold. Um, and then we'll go from there. So, Dear Father, we approach your throne on behalf of the mothers whom you have entrusted with the care of your most precious little ones. We thank you for creating each mom with a unique combination of gifts and talents. We thank you for the sacrifice of self each mom gives for her children, for the late nights spent rocking a colicky infant, for the hands calloused from washing, wiping, scrubbing, hugging, patting, disciplining, holding, painting, and pouring. We thank you for the gift of time moms give for their kids, whether it's stay-at-home moms, working moms, and moms who have some combination of the two. We thank you for the flexibility of moms, for their tirelessness, their perseverance, and their devotion. We pray you give each mom strength, help her to see in each mundane task the eternal cosmic significance that you place on motherhood. Help her to understand that the most radical, world-changing events may be happening anonymously in her home. Help her to forgive those who undermine her significance. We pray especially for single moms who must lean on you for the fathering of their children. We thank you that your big arms surround children who may never know their earthly father. We pray for our friend who is still waiting to be a mother. Would you touch her with special encouragement and strength today? Father, let her know that you see her struggle and care about her grief. Give her faith to believe you hear her prayers. Reassure her that you have plans to bless her. Give her a hopeful future. We ask you to be the daily bread of tired mothers. We ask you to be their living water. We ask you to be their source of spiritual and physical strength. We pray that the same grace that flowed from father to son to us in salvation will flow from mothers to their children. We pray that each mother rejects perfectionism and instead embraces the goodness of the gospel. We pray the rhythms of repentance and forgiveness shape each other. Lord, give each mother a worshipful reverence of you, the creator and sustainer of life. Help them to rest in the knowledge that they are but stewards of your children and that only your spirit can produce change into the hearts of each boy and girl. May each mother find rest in you. Most of all, Lord, on this day, which we honor mothers, may we love and cherish the special women who have borne us, 
who have nurtured us and who have prayed for our well-being. May our hearts overflow with gratitude to you who formed and knit each of us in a mother's womb. Amen. O oh God, all of these spoken requests and all of our unspoken requests we present to you in the gracious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. So one of my uh, family's favorite music artists is Andrew Peterson. We sing some of his songs here. You've probably heard them. He's a masterful lyricist. And one of the albums we've been listening to a lot at my house is his Burning Edge of Dawn album. One of the songs that he wrote has been resonating with me a lot recently. The title is called The Rain Keeps Falling. And some of the lyrics go like this. I will not be singing them today. I tried to be brave, but I hid in the dark. I sat in that cave and I prayed for a spark to light up all the pain that remained in my heart. And the rain kept falling. Well, I'm scared if I open myself to be known, I'll be seen and despised and be left all alone. So I'm stuck in this tomb and you won't move the stone and the rain keeps falling down. Perhaps you have felt that way. Perhaps it's this study of Job that's finally gotten to me and maybe it's getting to you. But it's probably more that the simple stresses of life break each of us down. I find myself constantly on a short fuse on some days, carrying around the anger and resentment with me to the next day instead of just letting it go. Life is hard sometimes, especially for moms and dads. And amidst all the big stresses and failings of our lives, it just keeps raining. But the song, like the book of Job, isn't one that's just full of woe. But it also doesn't end happily. Instead, it ends very realistically. Andrew Peterson writes, my daughter and I put the seeds in the dirt, and every day now we've been watching the earth for a sign that this death will give way to a birth, and the rain keeps falling. Down on the soil where the sorrow is laid and the secret of life is igniting the grave, and I'm dying to live but I'm learning to wait, and the rain keeps falling. Both before and after these stanzas is a simple refrain sung by a young female voice, peace be still. Each time it's repeated four times over and over again. If the busyness and stresses of life keep you from being still before God regularly, as I certainly struggle to do, maybe that's the key learning to be still, and learning to wait. I'm going to pray through Psalm 130 today, which has a mix of different emotions, the joyful recounting of what God has promised to do and the patient waiting for the Lord to actually do it. And if you've been struggling recently with life as I have, I'd invite you to think about one thing that's stressing you out, just one. And pray that the Lord would give you patience to wait and trust him to take it from you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the chance that we have to worship you today. And I thank you for bringing all of us here on this your day. Lord, out of the depths we cry to you. Hear our voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of our pleas for your mercy. If you, O oh Lord, marked our iniquities, who could stand? But with you we know there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. We wait for you, for you, Lord, our souls wait. And in your word, we hope. Our souls wait for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, much more than watchman for the morning. Lord, you call us to hope in you, for with the Lord there is steadfast love to be found, and with you is plentiful redemption, and we know that you will redeem us from all of our iniquities. 
We ask, Lord, that you would continue to show your kindness and graciousness to each of us. Draw us close to yourself. Help us to learn to be still and to wait. We thank you, Lord, most especially for the gift of your son, without whose sacrifice we would be hopelessly lost. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We're going to be reading together the uh, public confession that's in bold, and then after that, take a moment for a private confession to the Lord. So, reading together. Almighty God, to know you is the fulfillment of our deepest longings and the satisfaction of our most ardent desires. Yet foolishly we have sought our pleasures elsewhere. We have put the seeking of idols, which are bound to leave us feeling empty, above seeking you. We have failed to love you with our whole heart, soul, and mind. We have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us for our sins, for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and grant that from now on we might serve you in newness of life. Amen. Take a moment to bring your confessions to the Lord. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will, cover my tra- I, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. The Lord has blessed us in many, in many and various ways, and so we draw your attention to the the uh, ways that you can give back to Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church on the board. Um, But let's sing about those blessings this morning. Let's rise up as we sing. We gather together. So please rise. Amen. Won't you please have a seat? Amen. If I could have the younger children join me down here at the front as we get ready for Children's Church. All right. Come on, gather around. Okay, ready? Let's pray. Let's fold our hands and bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you that we can be here with you today. We pray that you would teach us and bless us and remind us how much you love us. And for that, we are very, very grateful. 
Be with us now as we go to Children's Church that we might learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. All sorts of things hidden away in this podium. Anybody missing a star charm? Looks like for a bracelet. Also, can I get somebody to take these baby bottles uh, to the back so you can pick them up on your way out? And they don't get stuck up here. Anyone that want to help grab this big tub? Okay. Why don't you have a helper? The, uh, so you'll want to fill those up and bring them back um, anytime, but hopefully by Father's Day. And uh, it seems like a small thing to fill a baby bottle with change, but each year as we gather together, it comes out to about $1,000 that we're able to contribute. So we'll see what happens this year. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Job. It's right before Psalms. So open your Bible in the middle. You'll probably go left. And uh, we are at the very last chapter of the book of Job, but not the last sermon in the book of Job. I can put this down, right? Okay. So I'm going to read the whole chapter today, chapter 42. As we are coming in here, the home stretch. So please listen carefully. As always, uh, it's, this is the word of God. Job 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly." For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. And he also, and he had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapik. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons. Four generations, and Job died, an old man, 
and full of days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the scriptures and making us your people. You have brought us to the book of Job this morning to learn more about how to deal with our own suffering and repentance and restoration. But most of all, Lord, we have come to learn more about you. We think of ourselves far too often, and we think of you far too little. So teach us about yourself, that our hearts would be open and our mouths would be shut. And in so doing, build our faith and help us to learn from you this morning. And so we pray, speak through the story of a man called Job, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us see Jesus. For in his name we pray, amen and amen. Well, we've all grown up with fairy tales in which the good guys win and the bad guys lose. And against all odds, the prince wins the princess and they ride off in the sunset to live happily ever after. The wicked witch gets it between the eyes and the greedy king is left holding an empty bag. However, the truth is, we all know life is not actually a fairy tale. And happily ever after ends up needing to leave room for the realities and challenges and hardships of real life. Perhaps you remember your first home. You called it your dream home. And shortly after moving in, some of the electric outlets didn't work. And the roof sprang a leak. And one of the faucets wouldn't turn on. Or how about that new job? You believed it would make it easy for you to get up in the morning. You thought it would be really fulfilling and would confirm your love of a career that you spent years preparing for. But many of the people there reminded you a lot of those you left behind at the last job, and the boss wasn't as perfect as you thought, and the health benefits weren't all that great either. How about that new car? smelled wonderful and ran great. Until that Monday morning, it wouldn't start. And then there was the afternoon when the guy parked next to you at the coffee shop and opened his door and gave you the mother of all dings on the side of your just polished chariot. How about that new baby? Do you remember thinking how great it would be to start a family and have that adorable little thing cooing at you from her crib in the newly decorated nursery? Everything was organized and clean and ready. And then the baby arrived after 36 hours of labor. And then she refused to nurse and had colic so bad she wouldn't stop crying for six months until she finally fell asleep and woke up 13 years later as a teenager. Farewell to fairy tales and fantasies. It is not an easy world. And yet it's easy when we consider Job to be tempted to think, yeah, Job had it tough, but look, it ended happily ever after for him. And at first glance, it did. We're told he's restored and blessed and he got twice as much as he had before. But this conclusion doesn't really work if you think about it. As someone who's lost a child, if having another child erased that hollow place in their heart. As someone who suffered with a painful disease or been hurt in an accident, if they ever completely forgot the effects. As someone who's been abandoned by friends or family or been the victim of a crime or abuse, if they look at life exactly the same way they used to. And now that we've come to the last chapter, we need to be careful we don't trivialize Job's troubles by saying, hey, he had more children, his diseases cleared up, and he got his money back. The reality is that Job will never look at life the same way again, even regarding the good things and the good life. He'll have an appreciation for his health like he's never had before, He'll look at money, wealth, and business from an entirely different perspective. He'll hold his children and grandchildren a little differently than he did in the past. He'll do this because he knows what it's like 
to lose it all in a couple of minutes, which is just about the amount of time it took for the messengers to arrive with the bad news when this all started. So it's not quite happily ever after. And yet there are some wonderful events about to take place, and they all start when God draws near to Job. When God draws near to Job, that's the first blank in your outline. If you're following in the outline, there's a lot of blanks today. So, But let's read again verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then twice he quotes the Lord, what the Lord has told him. So who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? It says, therefore, responding, it's quoting the Lord. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Again, he quotes the Lord, verse 4. Here and I will speak, I will question you, and you will make it known to me. And he responds, verse 5. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. <coughs> People say all sorts of things online that they would never say in person. For some reason, when we can't see the other person, somehow it seems less personal. We stop filtering what we say about them, and social media can quickly become anti-social. The end of the book of Job acknowledges this. Its first six verses record how Job replies to the Lord at the end of God's speeches. And Job confesses that he said some outrageous things about God from a distance that even he wouldn't repeat now that he's seen God up close and personal. He says, verses 5 and 6, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What has caused the change of heart? Well, two weeks ago, we saw that Job had received a God-sized picture of God. And last week, we learned that we need to experience God for ourselves, not just to hear about him, but to know him personally. There's no substitute for knowing God and coming into his presence. And that's exactly what has happened to Job. And because of that, Job has learned some things that he thought he already knew, but didn't fully grasp until he found himself in the presence of a wise, holy, and loving God. So what did he learn? Well, Job has discovered that God is far greater. It's going to be about six of these far something. Job has discovered that God is far greater than he ever imagined. While God was the object of his dutiful worship, the subject of his theological discussions, it seemed a small thing to question God, to question God's judgment and his justice and his actions. And Job has repeatedly done that. He has questioned God and he has accused God. Job 7.20, why have I become a burden to you? 9.23, God mocks the calamity of the innocent. 12.4, I who called to God and he answered me, a just and blameless man, am a laughingstock. Job 19, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. I call for help, but there is no justice. Job 27, the Almighty has made my soul bitter. But now he's seen God. And he can hardly believe the recklessness of what he has said. And the Hebrew phrase in verse 5 carries the sense of I heard, when it says I heard of you, it really carries the sense of I heard a secondhand report of you. Someone has told me about you. And Job was already a believer at the start of this book, but now his secondhand hearing has become firsthand faith. Job has discovered that God is far greater than he imagined. He's also discovered that God is far more glorious than he ever imagined. What he said about God in his speeches was largely true, but now he's seen God and realizes 
how much of it was watered down. Even his great speculations about God's glory were at risk of insulting the Almighty by masking the true scale of his glory with faint praise. The Lord started his speeches in chapter 38 by accusing Job of obscuring the true wisdom of his plan and purposes. And Job responds at the end by freely confessing this is a fair accusation. Verse 3, quoting the Lord, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? It was translated as darkens counsel. Some versions have obscures counsel. And he says, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. God is far more glorious than Job's imagined. Job has discovered that God is far more powerful than he ever imagined. At the start of the book, he had some sense of God's sovereignty. He grasped that both the good and bad things that take place are equally the acts of God, but he never reflected on the Lord's constant activity in creation until he heard God speak. He never considered what the oceans and clouds and ice and constellations proclaim about God's well-ordered rule. He never stopped to recognize uh, that the Lord is the zookeeper to the ravens, the midwife to the mountain goats, the master to the wild donkey, and the commander of the eagles. Job never reflected on the power that the Lord asserted against the forces of chaos to create the world or on the power that he continues to assert against those evil spirits now. At the start of the book, Job lived as though the Lord were the mightiest of creatures. But now he sees how far short that falls of the truth. That God is not a creature. He is the almighty creator. And he confesses that verse 2. He says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job has also discovered that God is far more righteous than he ever imagined. The primary theme of the book of Job is the vindication of God's justice in the face of suffering. So we can see verses 4 through 6 as his great crescendo to this book. Job ends his own speeches by demanding a hearing from God in his heavenly courtroom. But now that Job has listened to the Lord's speeches, any thought of defending his own righteousness has gone out the window. Job admits he's out of answers. He has been silenced by the word of God, literally. Just as the Apostle Paul says, we all must be, Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world be held accountable to God. God is far more righteous than he ever imagined. Job has also discovered that God is far more merciful than he ever imagined. Conviction of sin alone is not enough to save us. Confession of sin has to lead to faith in the Savior. And Job acknowledges this by declaring that he's seen the Lord when on one level he hasn't. He has seen the windstorm out of which the Lord spoke to him. Exodus 33 warns us that no one can ever see God and live to tell the tale. So Job is referring, must be referring to his confidence that the visions he had earlier of a great redeemer in heaven were genuine. There were visions from God and that his sins will truly be atoned for. He received that, uh, that promise and he takes the words of God now as sort of a down payment on the promise he received back in chapter 19 where he said, I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. Job has discovered also that God is far more interested in having a relationship with us than he ever imagined. The Lord refuses to play along with any of our spiritual formulas because he doesn't want us to be machines left on autopilot. He wants close friends who freely choose to worship him in spirit and in truth, not because they have to, but because they want to. 
the Lord is willing to pay the ransom price for our sins as our Redeemer, then he must be serious about having a relationship with us. Discovering this seemed to make it all worth it. And therefore, Job confesses that God is far wiser than he imagined. He knew what he was doing all along, even when Job started doubting him. What we learned back in Job 28 was right after all, after all, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. Wisdom is not to be found in textbooks. It's found in fearing the Lord and learning to walk with him day by day. The great Victorian preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he taught his congregation that any blessing that comes as the result of the Spirit's work in your soul is a true blessing, though it humbles you, though it strips you. Riches may not do it. There may be a golden wall between you and God. Health will not do it. Even the strength and marrow of your bones may keep you at a distance from your God. But anything that draws you nearer to him is a true blessing. Job fully believes that now. He's no longer complaining about how much suffering the Lord has put him through. He's now amazed at how much it has helped him to discover about God. And with that confession, we see that God vindicates Job. Verses 7 through 9, God vindicates Job. You can't help but catch the phrase, God uses four times in these verses, my servant Job. Starting at verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams. This is a huge sacrifice. Take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Just imagine that scene. First of all, Nobody knows where Elihu went. He seems to have disappeared as quickly as he appeared. But here's the three friends. And these three have spent hours, one condescending, unfeeling, uncaring, super spiritual speech after another, rebuking Job as a rebellious man worthy of God's judgment. Talk about kicking a man while he's down. They added layers of grief to Job's misery. They accused Job of being guilty of committing some horrible secret sins in order to have received God's terrible judgment. They implied that Job's sins were the reason his children had died and his fortunes were lost. Not so, God thunders. Not so. Job is my servant. And you three, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, need to come to Job, who is my servant, and my servant will pray for you. Is this the ultimate vindication or what? How's Job reacting right now? Do you think he's pointing fingers and saying, hey, I told you so? I don't think so. Job's already repented of saying things he shouldn't have said. And for those who suffer, there are more important things than being right, like being satisfied with the approval of God. I imagine, doesn't tell us, but I imagine tears trickling down Job's cheeks as he hears God call him my servant. And frankly, that's enough. God has spoken on his servant Job's behalf, and he accepts his servant's prayer. And thus we see that God restores Job, verses 10 and 11. God restores Job. Proof that Job is not 
gloating over his friends is the fact that he's now praying for him. He prays not for himself and not for uh, his own restoration of fortune. He's praying for these men, these three friends who have wronged him. He has forgiven them, and Job is praying for God to show them forgiveness and mercy too. How does a person do that? Job recognized that he had maligned God and had been forgiven, and now he's turning to forgive those who have maligned him. Our problem in forgiving others is that we've often forgotten how much we have been forgiven. A truly repentant sinner is the one most willing to forgive other sinners. We begin with verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. The extended family shows up. This is a surprise. Job had brothers and sisters. Who knew? They're never mentioned before. Where were they when the chips were down? We don't know. It seems like, we can't be sure, we're not told specifically, but it seems like Job's family had just hung him out to dry. I mean, abandoned them and ignored them. And my best guess, it's just a guess, but my best guess is that Job's family, like his three friends, were afraid of receiving God's judgment too. In other words, if Job is being judged by God, then any attempt to help him might incur similar judgment. So everyone keeps their distance. And that means in order for this family gathering along with the friends, in order for that to take place with the level of fellowship that's indicated here, there must have been apologies offered and forgiveness demonstrated towards every family member and every estranged friend. And you can only imagine what they said when they came to Job now. Job, we're sorry. We didn't know what to do. We're sorry for not helping you. We were wrong. We didn't believe you were innocent, and like everyone else, we thought you were under the judgment of God. We should have known better. We knew you walked with God. Please forgive us. And he does. And then God not only restores Job, But with great abundance, he blesses Job. God blesses Job, verses 12 to 17. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapak. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. So God has promised that he would double Job's fortune. And God did double the number of sheep and camels and yoke of oxen and female donkeys. Verse 12. And then he gives Job and his wife ten more children, the same number of children they had before, which means that Job and his wife actually double the number of children because they don't entirely lose the first ten. They've just lost contact with them in this life. Their first ten children are still counted because they're still alive, just not on this earth. And Job and his wife will see them again someday In paradise, won't that be a mother's day? And all of this displays the wisdom of God. Job's healing and restoration includes people. It's a restoration of relationships, which Job now knows are far more important than wealth or cattle. And notice that Job seems especially proud of his daughters, as most fathers are. Verse 14. 
called the name of the first daughter Jemima and the name of the second Keziah and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. Jemima means dove. Keziah literally means a perfume derived from cinnamon, commonly translated as a sweet fragrance. And Karen Hapuk means the horn of eye paint, what we would call eye shadow. So for all you dads looking for a verse against makeup and mascara, the godliest man in the East actually named one of his daughters Eyeshadow. Sorry. And then verse 15, and in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. So all their names point to their beauty, and all three share in the father's inheritance some, that's huge. That's something from which women were normally excluded in the Old Testament. And Job includes them here. That's a big deal. And then finally, after this, Job lived 140 years, saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations, and Job died, an old man and full of days. This is a Hebrew way of saying he was satisfied with a long and full life. If anyone qualified to live happily ever after, it would be Job. But even Job would eventually grow old again. He probably stood by many more graves along the way to his own death. And only then would he learn the whole story. There is a great series of websites they commend to you. It sends out a daily devotional called He Reads Truth. It's a devotional written by men for men. And then there's one called She Reads Truth, which are devotionals written for women. And Kids Read Truth, devotionals written for kids. And they're very personal. They're very well done. They're very biblical. And one person writing for She Reads Truth wrote this about today's passage. She said, I've always been afraid of the book of Job. I'm afraid of Job's story, same way I'm afraid of Abraham's and Mary's and the disciples. I'm afraid the cost of following Jesus will be too much for me. Unlike Abraham, who obeyed God and prepared his son for sacrifice, or Mary, who was willing to face scandal as an unwed mother, or Jesus' first disciples, most of whom died as martyrs. I'm afraid that when faced with the sharp rock of suffering, my faith will shatter like glass. I don't trust my flesh, which I know will fail. I'm afraid to live fully, to love completely, and trust wholly. I am afraid to suffer. Of course, I have suffered a variety of wounds, as we all have. If there's a more common thread to humanity than suffering, I'm not sure I know it. And so Job's story is naturally my story, and your story, and your neighbor's story, and every member of your family's story, and that person who served you coffee this morning's story too. In chapter 42, Job's story ends with the same stunningly beautiful conclusion that we are all offered, repentance and restoration. Job cries out, I know that you can do anything. I reject my words and I am sorry for them. He knows that God is just, merciful, and mighty to save. Job doesn't expect to be made whole, to have everything and everyone he's lost restored. It is enough for Job to know that God is God, and he is not, and to repent of his own pride. But now, even after the storm has passed, for the next 140 years, Job has to live with the fact that it could all happen all over again. Today, tomorrow, next week, whether he's righteous or unrighteous, his understanding of God and God's world has fundamentally changed. And not only might the next messenger from the herd bring bad news, there's nothing Job could do to prevent it. Nothing. No guarantees. Job's lament is past, but the story is far from over. Remember back in chapter 38 to 41, God speaks. He proclaims his power, his justice, his righteousness, his sovereignty over all things. It is a mic drop moment, one that needs no punctuation, no follow-up, 
But after Job's cry of repentance, God responds once more to Job in a manner that is so kind and so lavish, we're compelled to react with awe and wonder, just as we did when we read that he breathed all creation out of nothing. Yes, God is mighty, unrivaled in power. Yes, God is sovereign, unrivaled in his commitment to justice. But also, God is good. And he promises us bountiful restoration. Job received restoration in his lifetime. His fortunes restored. His flocks and herds multiplied. His home filled with children. Our suffering may not and often does not end with restoration in this life. Death wounds us, sickness steals from us, broken relationships limit our ability to trust, and tragedy on a global scale haunts even our happiest days. Our hope is not in the here and now. Ours is a future hope, formed and grounded in God's word, molded by his mercy and secured by his son. And we will experience the restoration and renewal of all things as promised in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is the only ending that makes sense to our stories of suffering. The kind and lavish response of a loving father who promises one day, to wipe every tear from our eyes. And only then will we learn the whole story. It's time to pray. Do that now. And then I'll close. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, thank you that you have spoken to us by your Son. Open our eyes that we might see our sin and then see our Savior. God, our Father, we bow before you and we confess our failure to remember your greatness, your glory, your power, your righteousness, your mercy, and your wisdom. Help us to discover, like Job, that you are far more interested in having a relationship with us than we can ever imagine. Lord, if anyone here this morning is overwhelmed by struggle, by suffering, by fear, by uncertainty, enable them to draw near to you so that you will draw near to them, bless them, and build their faith. And so work in each of our hearts as we learn from a man called Job and draw us ever closer to the one who secures our restoration, your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen and amen. Amen. Uh, let's rise up again. We're going to close out our worship with Oak Church of Christ, Invincible. <clears throat> of Christ invincible, the people of the Lord, empowered by the Spirit's breath and nourished by His Word, His covenant of grace will be our portion evermore. Chosen people called by grace 
the sons of Abraham, who walk by faith in things unseen and on his promised stand, that every nation of the earth will hear a boundless love that causes broken hearts to Church of Christ in sorrow now, where evil lies in wait. When trials and persecutions come, this light will never fade. For though the hordes of hell may rage, their power will not endure. Our times are Father's hand, our anchor is secure. O Church of Christ, upon that day when all are gathered in, when every tear is wiped away and every trace of sin, where justice, truth, Before the benediction, let me remind you, many of you know Sandy Chamberlain. She has been a member of this church for well over 10 years. She's not often here because she is disabled. Uh, Her husband, Floyd, who is not a member here, passed away uh, this week. And so Sandy is uh, grieving and uh, feels a little isolated um, and uh, has a ton of decisions to make. And so if you would be in prayer, I'll be visiting with her again tomorrow. Uh, If you would be in prayer uh, for her, uh, that would be great. Thanks. And I think there's a meal sign up. for. Even if you don't know Sandy, uh, check that out. Perhaps you can uh, help her out uh, in some way. Hear the blessing of God from the prophet Isaiah. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. God bless you.